all of you know that the, chap the lecture series on nonlinear dynamics conducted by the Department of Nonlinear Dynamics for 2018 with the support from USA 2.0. I am happy to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Martha Sarkin, the top from the Department of Mathematics, Indian Institute of Technology, Open Punjab. Dr. Tanta obtained his PhD from IIT Karakpur in the year 2009. For a year, he carried out his first postdoctoral work at the Mathematics Research Institute, University of Extreme, United Kingdom. He then moved to Germany and continued his second postdoctoral studies for a couple of years at Complex Systems Research Group at the University of Oldenburg, Germany, as well as Alexander von Humboldt Fellow. He joined as an assistant professor at the IIT Rupert in the year 2018. He has been elevated to associate professor in the same department in the year 2018. Since then, he is serving at various capacities at the department. Dr. Tata is doing research on interdisciplinary nature covering nonlinear dynamics, mathematical biology, and theoretical ecology. More specifically, he and his group is investigating effects of climate change of ecosystems, studying spatio-temporal dynamics of complete ecological systems and network relations. He has been a mentor for several students and five students are currently pursuing research studies at NCU. With this short introduction, now I invite Dr. Master Sergeant Gatta to deliver his lecture. Over to you, Dr. Gatta. Thank you so much, sir. So I thank Professor Sendrivelan for this uh, kind invitation and I also thank Harjitashan University for giving me this opportunity to present my work. Sir, am, am I audible clearly? Yes, 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 sir. Yes. Okay. Yes. Slides are also possible. Yes. Okay. So in today's lecture, I plan to give you a brief overview on tipping points in complex systems. So this research area has increased a lot in recent times. So my, the plan of my talk is that I would like to give a brief introduction of the subject. And then I would like to talk about the different types of tippings that occur in complex systems like bifurcation induced tipping, noise induced tipping, and rate induced tipping. I'll give a very specific explain this entire thing with a specific example of a model of insect outbreak. Then I will talk about critical slowing down and associated early warning signals. And at the end, I will talk about a very relevant recent research on rate dependent tipping in non autonomous systems. Although I will very briefly introduce that, I will talk about future directions. So let me first introduce, as the title of my talk is tipping points in complex systems, let me first start with the definition of the tipping point. So I googled and I find in the Webster online dictionary that the definition of tipping point, the critical point or a critical threshold in a situation, process or system beyond which a significant and often unstoppable effect or change takes place. So that is called a tipping point. Let me give this nice example of a wine glass. So you see that wine glass in the left, these two left two wine glass they are standing. So if you push the third wine glass a little bit, if the force you exert, if it does not cross a critical threshold, it will again come back and restore its original position. But the moment the amount of force you give will cross a critical threshold, the wine glass will tip to an alternative state. So, so this is the basic idea of a tipping point that a system will basically suddenly change from one state to another state upon crossing a critical point or a critical threshold. So this research on tipping point heavily become popularized after Malcolm Gladwell published this paper, The Tipping Point which says that how little things can make a big difference. This is a popular book and it was international bestseller for quite some time. So the very existence of a tipping point in complex systems, that actually triggers the research on critical transitions. Because at a tipping point, when a system shifts from one alternative state to another alternative system, that resulted in a sudden transition in the system that is called a critical transition. So, more generally, what is a critical transition? In complex systems, tipping or critical transition is a sudden, large, often irreversible, and usually unexpected changes in the state of a dynamical system precipitated under the influence of small stochastic perturbations. So, when you have a dynamical system, 
when you give a small stochastic perturbation to the system and if the system crosses a tipping point then if it goes to an alternative state and the change that happens in the system is quite large we call that transition as a critical transition so here is a very nice example of a critical transition from a natural system so the figure in the left side is a figure of a forest cover so you see this forest cover now in the left side shows completely green so if you think that this green forest cover green forest cover is one steady state now when there is an insect outbreak the number of insects are more there are less predators and there is a lot of food available what they do they immediately eat the complete greenery and we have this gray cover so then the system after the insect outbreak shifts in an alternative state so the first one before outbreak if you consider one state and after outbreak if you consider another state so that transition happened in a very short time and that is an example of a critical transition and this natural phenomena occurs quite regularly in africa in africa there is african army worm moth which is called which scientific name is sporeptora exempta so the, in the right hand side we have i have this figure you can see in large region of africa there are even chances of 51 to 100 percent so almost every year there are the sudden sudden transition so this is one nice example of a critical transition and below is a fantastic book written by martin Schaeffer, which introduces the subject of critical transitions so the critical transitions in nature and society this is a book published from princeton university press so let me talk about different types of critical transitions so there are mainly three types of critical transitions b tipping r tipping and n tipping the first figure in the left hand side is an example of b tipping so what happens the red diagram it is the, just the deterministic bifurcation diagram of a dynamical system and where there is one parameter let's say c now so the, while drawing the bifurcation diagram one knows that i need to vary a parameter so here the y2 axis represents the parameter the solid line in the upper state it is the upper steady state the dashed line is the unstable one which actually separates the upper and lower steady state lower steady state is the below one so this dashed line is actually you can think like a potential barrier between both the alternative steady states now if one varies within a time frame the driver the grazing rate the way i have drawn in this figure like if you vary your grazing rate 1 to 2.67 within a time frame 0 to 1000 then what you get and if noise is present in the system you get a stochastic trajectory right so there this blue one is the stochastic trajectory and the moment the stochastic trajectory crosses this bifurcation point these two points are, are saddle points i'll come there and then you suddenly shift to an alternative state which is the lower steady state so this is called a bifurcation induced tipping because the tipping happens in the vicinity of a bifurcation point the second one is an example of rate dependent tipping and which happens in a non-autonomous dynamical system so here what happens like this dashed line is a quasi steady state so you are varying a parameter and with the change in the parameter uh, the steady state changes like this in the dashed line now if you start varying the parameter above a critical rate let's say the parameter is rho and you start varying the parameter above a critical rate rho c so basically d rho by dt or, or let's say the parameter is lambda d lambda by dt equals to rho and the moment you consider that rho more than rho c the system is not able to follow the quasi steady state the dashed line and suddenly tip to an alternative state which is here a zero state so this is called an r tipping and what is an n tipping so now let's say go back to the first diagram i fix the parameter value somewhere at 2 and then if i just simply draw the time series i, I will be having two alternative steady states right these two red lines and if there is noise in the system then what will happen the moment system will cross one potential one potential well the, the moment it crosses the potential barrier and moves from one potential well to another potential well so if it is in the lower potential well it is at the lower state and if noise can cross the potential barrier and takes it to the upper state it sometimes it stays in the upper state and then again it comes back to the below state so in this way there when there is a stochastic switching or it is a purely noise induced transition because no driver i am varying 
we are just playing with the noise intensity. So the noise intensity is there and we are just adding the time and the system is depending upon in which which potential well it is, it stays stay sometime about either in the lower steady state or in the upper steady state. So this is called an end tipping or noise induced tipping. So in today's lecture, I will try to cover in detail B tipping and I will also try to talk a little bit about R tipping and why these two tippings are important because for these two sorts of tipping, it is possible to have some kind of analytical calculation and you can forecast the occurrence of the sudden transitions or critical transition. And in tipping, that is fundamentally unpredictable. So it is purely noise induced and no one can predict that in which state system will be. So let me give more examples. So this picture is one example from a, from a spatial system which is having self-organized spatial patterns. So this is an example of a semi-arid system, so which is a biological system which is neither in a wet region nor in the desert region, which is somewhere in between. And as the dryness of climate increases, you can see the thick black line is the mean vegetation biomass, the dashed line is an unstable one and the lower thick black line is another steady state. Now as the dry and in this in this patch special diagrams, the lighter uh, zones are basically there is no vegetation available, it is just the barren state and the green ones where the vegetation is available. So as the dryness of climate increases, you see these white regions or the light color regions started increasing, right? And the moment the driver, which is the dry net of climate crosses, the system suddenly tips from this little bit vegetated state to a completely barren state where it is completely light. Now here is another example. This is a very nice example, example of a critical transition in social system. I have taken this picture, the right hand side picture from a very nice paper written by Edward Van Ness. What do you do? You mean tipping point from trends in ecology and evolution. So this paper tells that the publication of Gladwell's book is actually an example of occurrence of a tipping point. So in, in the year 2000, the book published. Before that, research articles including the word tipping point was re were really less. But the year Malcolm Gladwell published this book, the number of publications including the word tipping point increases. So the publication of this book, which is a really a small event when there are many books are publishing the getting published simultaneously. So publication of this book is an example of a tipping point in, in social system. This is an example uh, of a tipping point in, a, in cancer biology. So this is a system, this system is having, uh, it, it includes miRNA, some JDB protein and snail and when we vary the snail concentration then what happens, the system is having three alternate states. So one is an epithelial state set, uh, another one is an hybrid state and the upper one is a mesial state. So the hybrid state is responsible for actually uh, formation of a tumor. So even we have studied that, so it's a published paper in PNS, we have studied that with, the, with small amplitude of noise in such a system critical transition can happen from one state to another alternate state and it is possible to forecast it before transition. This is an example of a critical transition in, in climate system. So as the global temperature is increasing, there is a certain, there is a possibility of sudden transition. So earlier it used to be Oligocene only and now as the global temperature has increased, the greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, uh, nitrogen dioxide, methane, these gases have been increased in the atmosphere and there is a transition from ice house to the Eocene state. So this is one example of a critical transition in climate system. There are more like the Amazon, Amazon rainforest, it is shrinking, West Antarctic ice sheets, they are melting. So these are all examples of, of tipping point and why did, it is important to study tipping point because tipping, tipping point in a particular system can lead to domino effect. So what is the domino effect? Domino effect is that one event triggers a chain of similar events, right? So here you see, if there is arctic ice melting, the top one, then that will trigger the melt in the greenhouse ice sheet 
and the greenhouse ice seed melting eventually leads to a sinking of modal forest. And if the permafrost also starts happening, and if there are these changes, then our, 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 uh, Atlantic circulation changes, Amazon rainforest, there are frequent droughts and fires, it also starts sinking, modal reefs are dying, and there are other effects as well. This is a very nice paper uh, by Juan Ruka and Simon Levin in Science. There, they have taken this idea even in a broader scale, considered different tipping events that can happen across the globe. And with real data, they have shown that there is actually a domino effect. And one event triggers other event, and that other event triggers another event. And in some cases, it is really strong. So, what are the questions we are interested in understanding? The questions we are interested in understanding is that how populations or complex systems with alternative states would behave in the stochastic world. Because most of the natural systems, noise will be ubiquitous, and obviously, we want to study how that noise influences the occurrence of a tipping point. The study of alternative steady states in different stochastic environments, and we all know that in the vicinity of a keeping point, if there is a bifurcation, then there will be critical slowing down. And can we use this information of critical slowing down to predict a critical transition beforehand? So, these are a list of very nice papers which talks about critical transitions in various systems. So, now I will give you a more specific example. A mathematical model which is I would like to talk about critical transitions in an insect outbreak model. So let me first start with what is an insect outbreak. This is a classic example of insect outbreak given in the paper by Ludwig in 1978. So you see that that with year the in insects they can stay in two alternative states. One is the upper upper state when the Abundance is close to this 55, and another one is the lower, lower state where the abundance is 0 0.05. So, the upper state of these insects happen, this spores part one happens when there are very high density of uh, food is available and less number of predators. And low, low abundance of this part one density happens when there is low amount of food available and alternatively, the or there is less number of predators is available. So, let me consider this very simple model, one dimensional model of insect outbreak. So, which is actually a full catastrophe model. So, this D V by G T is R V 1 minus V by K. So, this is the growth term in this in this equation and uh, which is just the logistic growth and then minus this P square by A square plus B square which is a holding type 3 functional response this is a depth term. So, there is a mass balance, rate of change in B is being controlled by growth, which is a logistic growth, and the time type 3 depth, right. And this R is the maximum growth rate, K is the carrying capacity, B and A, they control the type 3 functional response. So, now if I draw a two parameter bifurcation diagram just by adding R and K, I find that in this RK region, so this lighter region where a more stable state exists only. And in this red region, there is the existence of bistability. So then, if I am at this uh, at the cusp point, before the cusp point from the left, I have just a monostable state. At the cusp point, that is just the beginning of a bistable region. And if I am inside uh, this bistable region, there exist bistable uh, equilibrium points. So let me explain it in a more uh, vivid way. So this is a nice uh, picture taken from this Schaeffer's paper in Nature. So if you are just before the cusp point when there is no alternative stable state, and if you still vary your one of the drivers, let's say carrying capacity in the previous example, you will see that the abundance may be decreasing, and it is taking just a gradu gradually decreasing, right? So if you want to, if one wants to push this all in the upper state, which is the upper steady state. To the, to the lower state, the lighter ball, then one has to give a large amount of Q, right. If we are close to the cusp point, then a small amount of forcing, though there is no alternative state, 
still a small amount of force is capable of capable to make the system to come to a lower abandoned state right and when there is the system is in the bistable regime then there are actually two tipping points so this this f1 point is a point where the lower steady state and the unstable the margin disappear this is the saddle node bifurcation point or a full catastrophe this f2 point is similar so the upper one is one steady state and the lower one is the unstable state so between the upper and lower there is this missing boundary is by this unstable equilibrium point right so here we see that if we give a small forcing and the system crosses the tipping point then this is there is a sudden jump in the abundance or in the system state from the upper to lower so this is one example of a b tipping right so this is when uh, we are just varying the condition but let's say there is a, an amount of noise is present in the system and let us just go to the figure d so when an amount of noise is present in the system it is possible though we have not crossed the tipping point f2 still an amount of perturbation is forcing the system to cross the potential barrier which is the unstable line and the system suddenly tip to the alternative steady state so that what happens in the system if i try to merge the potential landscape together with the bifurcation diagram it will look like this so when the ecosystem state is at this at the, the first one then you see the upper steady state is the only steady state right so the potential barrier the, uh, the potential potential landscape looks like this right so this wall is the system steady state which is in a potential well corresponding to the upper steady state so now if i move the conditions let's say when i cross this f1 point then i have two states but the upper steady state the the potential well corresponding to the upper steady state is more deeper why because the distance from the potential barrier is high and the potential well of the lower steady state is is not that deep it's actually shallower so now as the conditions basically moves then what happens there will be an intermediate state where both of them are almost equally stable because the depth of the potential wells are equal and once uh, it is it, the condition is at the right extreme so there is no more d and it crosses the f2 point there is no more the uh, upper steady state and if, if there is small tiny perturbation or at in the vicinity of f2 or if one crosses f2 the system is at the at the alternative state the lower steady state so then this is in the deterministic framework and as i said that uh, in natural system noise will be present then the question comes what what stochasticity to do with ecological dynamics there is a very nice paper written by Kim Coulson, Page Man Rohini and Marcellus Pasquale. So in that paper they have this very nice figure, they have shown that when there is no stochasticity, the, there are two species P and N and with time, though there, there is an initial transient oscillation, but the transient oscillation dies out and the system reaches equilibrium states. So these are basically point equilibrium, right? But if you add stochasticity in the system what may happen that is in the right figure if you add stochasticity in the system the transient oscillation may sustain and the system may start showing cycle behavior so the point is that noise changes qualitative behavior and it is important to study the dynamical systems in the presence of noise so what we do so we have that insect outbreak model the deterministic part db by dt is rb1 minus b by k minus of bb square square plus b square and then b into epsilon t where this epsilon t is the is the noise part and uh, i consider a multiplicative stochasticity for my model so that's why this gx is basically this b and the noise i consider one can just consider a gaussian wide noise with zero mean and mean variance i have considered just this all once and will process with correlation time two so this moving process it looks like it is having this form d epsilon by dt equals to minus of epsilon by tau plus one by tau sigma by rho over two epsilon zeta this zeta is a gaussian white noise with zero mean and unit variance this and then we multiply with the noise amplitude sigma and tau is the correlation time and epsilon is eventually 
is going to give us the correlated noise. And the correlation, autocorrelation function of epsilon is, is given by this. So, it is sigma square by 2 by 2 p to the power minus of t by t prime by 2. So, here I have used in this form and some people can use that in the long range form 1 by mod of t minus t prime to the power beta. And if one varies then that exponent beta, the noise color will change. So, then I have the deterministic model dB by dt with that f of v and then I have added v into epsilon t and then I have one equation d epsilon by dt. So, after some calculation, I will end up with this equation of dB by dt where g tilde b tau and hb and gb are given in this form. Then from this equation, I want to calculate the focal blank equation which is a partial differential equation by uh, that describes the time evolution of the probability density function. So, that tells you what is the probability that the system is at a state b at a particular time t. So, this is the Fokker Blank equation when uh, there is this colored noise present in the system. And from this Fokker Blank equation, I can actually derive the stationary solution from uh, of the previous equation. And this the solution is, is given by this. And where this p s v tau is the SPDF steady state probability distribution function. And if you let the tau tend to 0, then it will simply represent the SVDF for, for white noise. Then we also have the deterministic potential if I do not consider the stochastic part which is given by this QB. But in the, when the noise is present in the system, we will be getting probabilistic potential. So that probabilistic potential is given by this expression. And so I can numerically simulate the stochastic trajectory. But if I want to see, if I want to have some analytical tech, analytical approximation then I can use this idea of our blank equation and determine two things from here one is the SPDF and another one is the probabilistic potential. So in the case of white noise when tau 0 so this left hand figure represents the probabilistic potential. So you see that when the noise intensity is low then the upper and lower steady state both of them they exist and they have some amount of resilience. So, if you give a tiny perturbation, uh, they will stay. Though the upper one, the distance, the uh, the uncovered circle is close to the up, the lower steady state. This uh, black ball in the left hand side. So that distance is very low. So a tiny amount of perturbation can push the system from the upper steady state to the lower steady state. But the moment I start increasing the noise amplitude, what I see that the potential probabilistic potential it changes its shape and the upper steady state is, is, is becoming flatter and shallower and the lower steady state is, is very deep and with a much steeper slope. So, it means that if there is a state in the upper steady state close to let us say v equals to 6 and you, you give a tiny perturbation to it, it will certainly shift to the alternative steady state that is the lower steady state and which is also visible from the probabilistic potential. For sigma 0 0.1, we see that the, the PSB is higher uh, at the upper steady state and which is lower at the lower steady state, which is close to V equals to 1. But as we increase the noise intensity, the, uh, the probability distribution around the lower, lower steady state increases and hence the lower steady state is more stable. So, what we see? We see that high density well is flatter and shallower and the low density well is deeper with a much steeper slope as we increase the noise intensity and this is also visible from the probabilistic potential. Now, if I just consider the colored noise, I find that there is not much effect. So, I fix uh, the noise intensity and I play with the noise correlation time and I see that there is not much effect of colored noise on the, on the potential barrier. So, what actually happens, the, uh, the uh, probability density becomes much greater as we increase the noise redness. So, you, here you see this, it is visible. So, the y scale is same for all the three two values. So, here it is pretty low, here it is more and here it is even more. And similarly, the, the probability distribution of the upper steady state also increases. So, now if I draw the SPDF extrema, which is having some similarity with the bifurcation curves, we see that when there is no noise, I could purely see 
to the bistable region, right? The highlighted with this pink color. If I increase the noise intensity, the bistable region has been has reduced, right? Which is uh, marked with the cyan color. And if I even increase more, it has even reduced, which is marked with gray color for sigma equals to 0 0.4. The moment it crosses even higher value, let's say at sigma equals to 0 0.75, I see that there is no more alternative steady state. And so, whatever wherever initial condition you detect, the system will actually settle in the vicinity of the lower steady state. However, if I fix the noise intensity and play with the noise correlation time, so with more, so with a when the noise correlation is zero for a particular uh, noise uh, strength, I see that this gray region marks the bistability region. But as I increase the noise correlation, there is an expansion of the bistability region. So the take home message is that white noise reduces the range of bistability with the increase of noise intensity, but large sigma bistability disappears completely. And for red shifted noise, for a fixed sigma increasing noise redness, tau has the opposite effect. The range of bistability actually increases with noise redness. So now what we have we have found, we have found that uh, there is a possibility of, of critical transition in the case when there is a bistability, right? For both the noise. Uh, for the in the case of white noise, you have to maintain a certain certain noise level so that there is a bistability. And in the case of colored noise, the correlation time you have to Whatever non-zero correlation time you take, there will be bistability. So now the now the question we ask that let's say a system in, is in the upper steady state, the way it is in this figure, in this, in this top left figure. So this is the picture of the basic potential, and you see the basin of attraction is quite high and quite deep. So the resilience of the system is very high. So what is resilience? Resilience is a system's ability to come back to its original position. When you give it a tiny amount of perturbation, so here obviously the resilience will be a little bit more, and and as we are away from the tipping point, or away from a region where there is bistability, or, the, or, or there is a, there is a chance of shift from an alternative from one state to an alternative state. Here in the in the right figure, this is also the similar figure where there is uh, the ball is in the high abundance state, but the alternative state which is low abundance state is also strong and the resilience of the high abundance state has reduced in comparison to the leftmost figure. So now what we do, we just simulate the system fixing the parameter value where the system is having high resilience, noise is present in the system, we just draw the time series, this is the fluctuating time series. Then we plot the state x versus state, state xt plus 1 and, this is, and then the, the points are arranged in this way. You see the standard deviation. If you calculate the standard deviation from the point, it, that is coming out to be 0 0.01 and correlation is 0 0.534. But if the and the yeah, the mean is 2.16, the moment you take a parameter value, calculate, consider a stochastic trajectory which is in the upper steady state. Again, calculate the state x t and state x t plus one. You see it is it is being distributed now in a bit more place and the most importantly, the SD has increased and the correlation has also increased. So, what is basically happening? The system is starting losing its resilience when it is close to the close to a tipping point. And uh, the as all of us know that when a system crosses the bifurcation point, it has to cross the eigenvalue lambda equals to g, and that happens at the rate it is called lambda g. So, if lambda is very close to zero. The system will, and you are at the vicinity of a tipping point. This system will take much larger amount of time to come back to its original state. So, what I'm trying to say that there will be a phenomenon called critical slowing down, and the recovery time will actually increase when the system, when you when you partner the system in the vicinity of a tipping point, and that can be captured by this SD and correlation. So. How to now really calculate it with a real time series? So, this is an example. So, this top figure is a stochastic time series. So, you see that this black one is fluctuating, it is coming, and at if the moment this, this trajectory crosses this F1 point, the system suddenly shifts to the alternative state, which is the lowest in the state. Now, the question is that before the system crosses the 
uh, or the crosses the F1 point, can we forecast it? The answer is yes in some cases. So, what do we do? So, we consider time series prior to the tipping point. So, F1 is the tipping point, you consider a stochastic time series prior to the tipping point. The time series you consider that should not include any point after the F1 point. And you can, so here let's say I, I am 5 points before I stop, you can even stop 10 points before. So, the signal of critical slowing down obviously will be more strong the close you go to the tipping point. So, then what we do, we, we feed to, to remove the unwanted fluctuations from the time series. Uh, we, we, we do some Gaussian detrending, we, we feed some bandwidth, and uh, we, then we, we, get, we, we get this red curve. Which is a Gaussian function, and then subtract the actual time series from this from this Gaussian function, and we get the residual time series. So the second figure, figure B, is the residual time series. Now what do we do? We consider a moving window. So here I have considered a 50% moving window, but it is possible to do more uh, rigorous calculation to determine the width of the moving window. So what is a moving window? So let's say here I have 100 points. So what I will do for the first 50 points. I will calculate standard deviation and auto correlation. The formulas are given here, right? And then I will plot the if the first standard deviation and the first auto correlation. Then I will just shift the window. I will move from one to fifty-one point. Then again, I will call calculate the standard deviation and auto correlation. I will be getting those two values. I will again plot this. If I if I just keep on doing this process and first plot the the standard deviation and auto correlation. For, for the points 50 to 100, then, and if I draw them one by one, I am going to get the short of trends. And why these increasing trends are there? These increasing trends are there because the system is having bifurcation and the time series, in the stochastic time series, information of critical slowing down, down is hidden. So, the moment you slowly appear close to a tipping point, the rate of return to equilibrium is actually is, 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 is increasing very much. So, it, the system takes very large amount of time. So, the fluctuation around mean increases. And that's why we see a higher standard deviation as we move closer to a leaving point and similarly in higher autocorrelation. So, the point is that so from a residual time series, if you calculate standard deviation and autocorrelation in the moving window, these increasing trends can work as a precursor of an upcoming sudden transition. Now, I said again how to apply. So, this is the same thing and there is this software, uh, this website available, early warning signals or where very nice package is available. One can apply that package and calculate this early warning signals. So, this was the part where always there was bifurcation present in the system. Now, let us think that a parameter, the parameter that we uh, consider when we just consider a, an autonomous dynamical system, the parameter will just simply gradually increase, right? Now think that if we give a rate to the parameter, the parameter will change. So let's see if I consider just a saddle for normal form, x dot equals to lambda minus x square, then I know that I will be drawing a bifurcation diagram with, with, by choosing different different values of lambda. But let's say if I consider a dynamical system x dot equals to lambda minus x square, which is a saddle node normal form, and that, that lambda I vary with a rate. So I consider d lambda by dt equals to r. So the system becomes eventually non autonomous, and I give a rate to that parameter lambda. Then what happens to the system that brings the idea of rate dependent tipping? Why it is important to understand rate dependent tipping? Because they, uh, there is this uh, UNFCC guideline, guideline which says that the ultimate objective is stabilization of greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere at a level that would prevent greenhouse dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. Such a level should be achieved within a time frame. So you see, they are talking about two things. They are talking about not only a level. So you, one has to one has to control the the greenhouse gas concentration up, and up to a level, but that we cannot achieve in infinite time. We have to achieve it in a time frame, right? So, the, the, 
together with the magnitude of change, the rate of change is, is also coming. So if I if I tell it more clearly, so let's say there is one degree increase in global mean temperature in last hundred years. Now, if there is 0.5 degree change in global mean temperature in the last 10 years, that is more dangerous than one degree changes in 100 years. Because here 0.5 degree changes happens, change happens in a, in a very small amount of time. So, the rate of change is equally important like magnitude of change. And there comes the idea of non-autonomous stability theory. So, and it is linked with the carbon facts in, in Russia, there are, there are peatlands and the peatlands, mostly in Russia, the peatlands contains a huge amount of uh, soil, soil carbon, which is 400 to 1000 billion tons. And as the, the global warming is increasing more and more, there is a fire in the forest and when there is a fire, fire in the forest, the soils are getting warmed up and this soil carbons are just uh, coming out to the atmosphere like a very fast rate and that is one cause of global warming because it increases the amount of atmospheric carbon dioxide so this is a picture i have downloaded from from uh, nasa's website climate.nasa.gov you see that before pre-industrial area this is a picture i think up to 2000 so before before pre-industrial area until 1950 the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was always below 300 uh, uh, ppm and this is a data from 400 uh, thousands a year to 1950. After 1950 when industrialization happened heavily and there is emission of carbon dioxide that amount of carbon dioxide has increased and now the point to be noticed that that, that increase happened in a very small amount of time. So, how to uh, take this idea in mathematical framework? Let us simply consider this normal form equation dx by dt equals to b minus x minus a whole square. So, this is uh, a figure I have taken from a very fantastic paper published by Cohen, Sitting, and Max Rietkar. So, this is a model you can easily see. This is a model of a saddle node normal form, but with a little tweak. So, normally we consider dx by dt equals to b minus x square. So here what we have done that dx by dt equals to b minus x minus a whole square. So now if we do a very simple calculation, if we just apply linear stability analysis, try to calculate first we will just put dx by dt equals to 0, we will find the equilibrium point. We will see that the existence of the equilibrium point will not depend on the parameter here because there will be a plus minus root over b term will come and that will uh, or simply a b term will come so that root over b term will come and that will uh, so when b is negative there will be no equilibrium point so the existence of the equilibrium point does not depend on a and if you calculate the stability you will also see that in the, in the lambda value there is no appearance of a so now the question is that if i vary my b by fixing one a value so let's say here i have fixed a value at six so what happens it is just a saddle node normal form. So if I decrease my b from b to b3 to b0, so there is a merge of the upper steady state and lower steady state. Lower steady state. So upper one is the stable state and lower one is the unstable one. They merge and disappear. So if you just vary your b, the moment b crosses 0, there is a chance of certain shift from the upper one to, to some other place, right? But the, and the point is that with a change in B, there is also a change in the potential length. So if you carefully see this figure for B2, the potential well is deeper. As I take B1, it is becoming shallower. At B0, alternative stable state does not exist. And when it is B minus 0.1, the system will basically start and moving to an alternative steady state. So this figure, obviously it is an example of B tipping. But the question is that here A, is a parameter which is a rate sensitive parameter and I see this in, a, in this normal form, right? So what do I mean by rate sensitive parameter? A rate sensitive parameter in a system is such a parameter that neither influences the existence criteria nor the stability criteria of an equilibrium point. Fine. Now you see that A parameter that neither existence the uh, neither influences the existence criteria nor influences the stability criteria. I also start 
I have started giving it array. So when dA by dt equals to zero, then the system the potential is obviously the potential does will, will never change its shape. That is by this gray shaded region. Why? Because I do not play with a b. I play with only a. So what happens if I give dA dt equals to consider dA dt equals to zero? The trajectory of the system still follows the quasi steady state, which is the just the thicker line, and there is this unstable state marked with the dashed line, the variation in A. Then, if I consider A2, there is a deviation from the steady state, quasi steady state, but still it goes back and starts following this quasi steady state. If it is A4, still it does follow the quasi steady state. But the moment A6, the system crosses the unstable equilibrium point. And shifts to an alternative steady state. So, without a, so the point is that with a rate independent framework, the potential is not changing, but just due to giving a rate to this rate sensitive parameter, I see that the system is dipped to an alternative state. So, this is an, an example of, of arc dipping, and so I can explain in a very nice example. So, this is one example this is example of a consumer resource system which is having a time scale separation. So, the resource is having a much faster time scale and the consumer is having a slower time scale. And if I just calculate the non trivial equilibrium point of the system, I get the resource density which is MRH by AM and this is the consumer density. The point to be noted that the resource density MRH by EA minus M, it does not include two parameters. What are those two parameters? It does not include R and the parameter K. So, now the question comes. That if and this is just the, the face portrait of the system for for a different uh, for different uh, uh, parameter values. So you see uh, for different R values. So if you see when you change R, then this resource equilibrium point is at six in the beginning. Consumer is at eight. But when I consider different R value or a different K value, resource equilibrium point is still at six. And the consumer equilibrium point is at 4.8. Why this resource equilibrium point is still at 6? Obviously, because this resource equilibrium has no dependence on the parameters R and K. Now the question comes: if I give a critical rate to parameter dr by dt, so if I start varying, if I make R time dependent and start giving it a rate, so if I do so, so if I if I would consider dr by dt equals to minus 0 0.1, what would happen? So you see that is the yellow line. Though there is a deviation, in some sense it is still close to the quasi steady state. But the moment I consider higher rate of change in dr dt, the resource abundance suddenly comes to zero and settles there. Obviously, there is uh, um, there is also a change in the consumer density. So what we see, this is called a, uh, a bottom up effect. So when there is no resource, so obviously consumer will also go down. But what happens actually here? The moment I vary, I decline the resource density above a critical rate, the system is not able to cope up with the change and it passes to the alternative state. So this is this can lead to a fantastic study of non-autonomous dynamical system. I will I will not elaborate that much. So what I do? So this is now the system. Uh, the the upper one, these first two equations are just the epsilon dr by dt resource equation dc by dt which is the consumer one they are coupled to r and c and then this r i make it time dependent and give it a rate t and by applying geometric singular perturbation theory and ideas of canons one can actually analytically calculate this critical rate v and for this problem uh, so there is a very recent paper published uh, with my PhD students in process of Royal Society A. So more detailed analytical calculation of similar systems can be found in this paper. So it is possible to analytically calculate critical rate. And for this problem, the critical rate depend, depends upon the initial condition R0 and some other, based on some other parameters, it is coming out to be R0 by 2. So what happens actually? So now from this three-dimensional system where you have three variables, capital R, capital C, and small r, you can calculate a critical manifold. So, just this curved surface. And on this critical manifold, if we change R, this blue line is the quasi steady state. Now, if I give a rate to this small R below a critical threshold, the system will not cross the black solid line 
which is uh, saddle manifold. And this system will eventually will not be able to cross the saddle manifold and, and actually will stay close to the QSE. But the moment it crosses the the R crosses the critical rate, then system is not able to cope up with the change and it crosses the and moves from the attractor portion to the repeller portion and eventually crash to G. So a detailed calculation of this critical rate is possible. So I would like to also talk about future directions in this critical point research. So a lot needs to be done when we consider transients. A lot can be still done in like studying critical transitions in complex networks. Keeping in non-autonomous systems like this let's and series systems are, are still very new, but the challenge is to figure out a parameter where one has to give rate, which is not a bifurcation parameter. Then one can also apply the idea of machine learning to forecast keeping. And uh, finally, a large body of literature talks about uh, forecasting or the just the onset of critical transitions, we need to develop algorithms or methods to mitigate giving. And these are a, a few papers uh, from my from my group that uh, highlights some of the aspects of, of critical transitions. And uh, thank you very much for your for your kind attention. And uh, before I stop, just I would like to highlight a conference that we are organizing at the International Center for Theoretical Sciences. The title of the conference is the same, keeping points in complex systems with my talk. And uh, though the deadline of application is over, this will be a hybrid conference and it will be uh, available. It will be live, there will be a live uh, uh, session will be happening in YouTube. If anyone is interested, can get the link from the ICTS website. So that's all. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nanda. So now the session is open for clarifications, doubts, questions. Uh, yes, Professor Amrika. Yeah. Yes. Do you do you see hysteresis in any of these transitions? If so, does it depend upon your noise intensity, the width of hysteresis? So, so madam, you, you are telling that obviously, if I talk about if I talk about B tipping, I see hysteresis. So, but if you if you change the parameter backwards, you will see that there is hysteresis. Yes, if I if I change the parameter, so I, if I want to study the recovery point, I will be able to see hysteresis. Or in the case of B tipping, I see. But this the bit of hysteresis depends on the noise. For example, all these happen only in the presence of noise. Correct. But, no, obviously, obviously, the width of the width of the hysteresis will depend on the amplitude of the noise. Because if the amplitude of the noise is very high, then what would happen that that ball will easily cross with that kick the potential barrier, and can easily cross the potential barrier and go go to the upper steady state. So it becomes thinner. It will become thinner, obviously, with, with large noise amplitude, it becomes thinner. And uh, how did you compute resilience? How how do I compute resilience? Is the time taken to go back or what is it quantified? So, so here the, you know that eigenvalue will, will give me some idea of resilience, right? If I am in a deterministic setup, if I am in a deterministic setup, eigenvalue will give me some idea of resilience. But if I am in stochastic setup, then the SPDF will give me some idea of resilience. Okay. Okay then. Thank you. Very nice talk. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Yeah. So, in all these studies, uh, when you talk about uh, big things like climate change and uh, the change in ecosystem and all that, <laughs> most of the papers I've seen are with some kind of models with ordinary difference equations and the uh, and are these predictions. But uh, and and you say there is critical slowing down and so on and so forth. But uh, have there been experimental uh, results on these kind of systems where? Uh, these uh, measures have been proved to be right and any real tipping has been predicted and so on. Yes, sir. So there, there are papers. So uh, there are papers by 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 a group of Tim Lenter in the University of Exeter. Okay. So he has used he has used real climate data and have shown that 
prior to a climate dip in these early warning signals work. Okay. And obviously, I have this paper with you that shows that in many uh, uh, systems. Uh, our system is down to that system. Yes, yes. There are papers. Let's say in this figure B, this 
low dashed line. So here, yeah, I, I have I gone very close to the limit point. You can keep the time up to 800 and still calculate. Then there are unwanted fluctuations. To remove the unwanted fluctuations, what I do, I fix the bandwidth. And so this is basically just detraining the. So in MATLAB, there are packages come. You can detrain the time series, fit a Gaussian function, and then uh, subtract the Gaussian function with the original time series, and you get the residual. So here I have now the residual time series. And this entire residual time series is prior to the tipping point. So I have information available before the system has crossed the tipping point. So now the question is that I have information prior to the tipping point. Now can I use the information to forecast that a system is going to cross the tipping point? So what we have done, I have considered here a 50% time series window. So if one wants to consider a different uh, different band, uh, moving time series window and a different bandwidth for uh, this Gaussian detraining, then one has to calculate something based on Kendall rank condition. So here, I need to do that. I simply consider a 50% moving window. So what I do, so I have let's say 960 points here. So 50% of the points would be 480. So for the first 480 points here, so that's why in, you see the first 480 points, I have no point in figure D, right? So here I have calculated the autocorrelation at lag one. So for the first 480 point, I calculate autocorrelation at lag one. So the value I get, I plot it here. Then I move my window. So I take one to 481 points. Then again, I, I draw the autocorrelation. I plot the autocorrelation. And then I keep on moving my window until I have the last 50% points, 480 to 960. Then I plot it. So the moment I plot then all the ensemble averages in a moving window, I see that there is an increasing trend. And this increasing trend actually signifies the presence of critical slowing down. So is that fine? Yeah, it's a take uh, the time series and do the same analysis for some values before this point, tipping point. Yes. The last curve D look like. So, 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 still you will be able to see an increasing trend. Huh. Still you will be able to see an increasing trend, but obviously, so this is a stochastic system. So, uh, that will be so here. How how good uh, my indicator will work will depend upon the choice of Gaussian bandwidth and also the moving window size. So, for that, I have to do a little bit more statistics. I have to. Uh, decide that based on Kendall rank correlation. So if we do that based on can if I do that based on Kendall's rank rank correlation, and if I let's say consider only first 800 points, and if there is a critical slowing down presence in the time series, I will be able to capture it. Okay, very nice. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Are there more questions? Okay, sir. I think uh, that's all. There are no more questions. Uh, so, since there are no more questions, uh, let me conclude the session. Uh, so, I would like to conclude the session by thanking the Professor Pansi Sari for that talk for giving a very interesting talk on tipping points and complex systems. I'm sure I think uh, I'm sure I our students might have learned some new developments in this direction. Thank you, sir. Thank you for accepting our invitation and giving a very interesting talk in this forum. Thank, Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for giving me this opportunity.